Just to give you a quick overview, this is just a snapshot. I'm going to leave that up for the rest of my talk and then we'll be done. No, I'm just kidding. We'll, uh, we'll go into some of these. But this just gives you a quick snapshot of some of the different things that we're working in. The Ag Tech Research Program at Georgia Tech, our vision is really to drive transformational innovation in advanced technologies for poultry, agribusiness, and food processing. Our focus is that advanced technologies component. Right? We rely on others, and when we talk about technologies, we're talking about automation, sensing, environmental. We're not necessarily talking about the genetic side, although we're starting to layer in on some projects looking at how do we generate sensors to drive some of those decision-making processes. I'm housed, or we are housed, in the Georgia Tech Research Institute which is a, uh, the applied research arm of Georgia Tech. It's fully up underneath the university, but we are 100% research faculty in terms of our designation. That said, we work with academic faculty both at Georgia Tech, but heavily at the University of Georgia, at Auburn. Arkansas is one we're looking to really build some relationships with because we do not have a College of Agriculture. We do not have a food science department. We don't have a forestry program. We don't have any of the traditional land grant um, programs associated with agriculture. So we rely very heavily on our partners to provide both the expertise and then usually their generosity and resources for uh, testing and evaluation. So when we look at the program, it's comprised of our faculty, students, and staff. They make up the research team. We have about 17 full-time faculty that work in the program. We have about anywhere from 30 to 40 students at any given time, and this includes high school interns all the way up through PhD students. So it goes the entire spectrum. And I'll tell you, when I have to recruit students into the program, a lot of times they're like, agriculture, poultry? What's that got to do with computer science and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering? And then I explain some of the challenges, right? some of the automation tasks, and some of the robotics tasks, some of the advanced sensing tasks, some of the biosensor tasks, and they go, wow, that's really cool, because it allows them to connect real world application to their experience in terms of disciplines of education and engineering and science. And so there's a big, we actually, actually have a good group of students that work with us. We have an external advisory board, and this is made up primarily of these groups down here on the bottom. And you'll notice our research partnerships over on the left. Universities, Ag Innovation Center in Georgia, we're a state program, so we're primarily funded through um, the state of Georgia, although we do compete for the traditional grant sources and industry funding. Um, we're a contract research organization, and one of the things we have the ability to do is do completely proprietary research, okay? So we can do that under an exclusive arrangement, um, and we do that from time to time. So all that you're gonna hear about today are the state program uh, supported research activities. Um, National Trade Associations, also our industry partners, you'll see many of those are, are um, uh, poultry related, a lot of allied industries, so equipment manufacturers as well as suppliers. Um, and there's also some in there that are, that are other than poultry, right? So baking, um, Durand Whalen's a fruit inspection manufacturer, um, and then obviously our state government as our, as our key stakeholder in terms of funding. So our, our, our research really focuses on three primary categories. One is environmental, energy, and food safety. The other is advanced sensing, and the last one's automation and robotics. I've only got one slide on this environmental and uh, food safety section because I, I, it's, it's important as part of our program, but it's probably not as much of an interest to you as some of the other work we're doing in automation <coughs> and advanced sensing. So I'm going to fly through this one really quick. be happy to talk to you later if you have questions about it. But these are just kind of four sample ex uh, projects that we're working on in terms of environment and, and food safety. The first one up on the left is our nanoparticle uh, research. And what we're looking at there is using magnetic beads coated with materials to do several things. One is do a pre-concentration task of extracting out Salmonella or Campylobacter from large sample volumes. And the beauty of these things are is you can coat them with specific materials. They attach to the different bugs. You can see Salmonella up in the top left-hand corner. And then we can use magnets to capture them out and do a pre-concentration task in terms of doing um, rapid assessment. The other one is um, phosphorus removal or, or foreign material removal. We can coat it with a different type of material and then extract out other foreign materials. Um, in this particular case for poultry, they're interested in phosphorus. So we can capture out that phosphorus, repurpose it, and then make it, um, reuse it again. Another project is al alternative chilling. Um, we had an advisory committee member who came from the fish industry and said, hey, listen, we did a lot of ice slurry chilling in the fish business. He said, I'd like to do some work and look at that. 
So we said, okay, and we took a look at, look at it. And so we've done a trial and we've looked at the thermal effectiveness, the thermal capacity of ice slurry, which is higher than chilled water. Um, it's much smoother. Think of it as a slurpy, a real wet, slushy slurpy, all right? And you can control that ice fraction very, very uh, uh, effectively now. And um, one of the side benefits that we've recognized as part of, of using a slurry mixture over just a cold water is there may be some improvement in terms of your bacterial loading. And we hypothesize that it might be due to some kind of a scrubbing effect that you're getting through that slurry and presenting the, uh, the, uh, the uh, disinfectants to the surface. Filtration, this looks at, this is alternative filtration methods for removing, capturing out after your first primary screen, secondary screen, your tertiary screen, looking at extracting out proteins, fat, solids from your wastewater stream that have, ex have external value that you could recapture, also helps improve your wastewater treatment processes. And then optical sensing for pathogens and, and chemicals. This is a, a device, a system, a biosensor platform that's been around probably now for almost 20 years, but the challenge has always been how do you distinguish live and dead bacteria, in particular if you have an effective intervention in your food processing facility, you may still have bacteria, but they're gonna be dead. And so building precursors or pre-filters for those to be able to separate out the live and dead bacteria has been one of the challenges that we've been trying to address. All right, now I'm gonna dive into some of our sensing work, and I think this may be a little bit more uh, interesting to, to the folks in this audience. And I wanna, Wayne, would you, would you wave your hand real quick? Wayne Daly's my colleague from Georgia Tech, and Wayne leads this project. So you have to understand, I manage the whole program. I've got lots of great faculty that lead the project, so I don't directly do all this work. Um, I have a great team that does it. So when we first started this, Wayne came to me and said, hey, listen, I think we can hear when those birds are stressed. And I said, what do you mean you think you can hear? Dr. Doolittle or something? And uh, who was it? Tom earlier said he's been asking the sows and they just haven't been able to tell him. Well, Wayne thinks he can tell, Tom, so you guys might have to have a conversation. I said, all right, well, let's do a survey, just an informal survey at IPPE one year. We did a quick survey. And out of the 20 or some flock managers that just, I mean, this was just totally informal, 19, or I think all, was it 19, Wayne, said that they could, either do it visually or audibly tell when there was a problem in that house. 18 of the 19 said they could hear it, okay? So when we started asking, well, what are you hearing? What is going on when you do that? We partnered then with a faculty member in electrical engineering whose specialty is speech and signal processing, all right? Now you have to understand, I'm an electrical engineer and I did signal processing on the imaging side and I'm still scratching my head going, I'm not sure how we're gonna do this. But we dove into it and sure enough, what we found is that we can look and we can identify early onset of several key things. We started off with environmental stressors, particularly we were looking at temperature stress and then ammonia and I'll show you one quick plot in a minute. And then on the disease side, we partnered with the University of Georgia's uh, veterinary college to see if we could detect early detection of um, laryngotracheitis and infectious bronchitis. So any of your respiratory diseases that affect the vocalizations of the bird or affect their breathing patterns. Again, this was done in conjunction with the poultry science department at UGA and then the vet school up there at UGA. And they were gracious enough to allow us to come and hang microphones in their grow out houses and kind of piggyback on some of the trials that they were doing. I wanna point out this picture up on the right here real quickly. We've got several instruments up there. We're testing different modes of collecting this data, and one of them, you'll see it in that little bag. I think I have a pointer here. Right there is a cell phone. How many of you have a cell phone in your pocket? How many of you know that that cell phone has more processing power today than the desktop did on your desktop 12 years ago, 13 years ago? That's impressive, right? And so now we can use this as a platform for doing data collection, for doing processing, whether onboard or pre-processing onboard before we upload it to a cloud. There's all sorts of possibilities now in terms of looking at how we manage this information coming in. Um, so we're looking at those. We've actually got an app that you can, I mean, it's not publicly available, but that we can install on a phone and then do data collection and do some preliminary looking at some of those aspects, in addition to the traditional microphones that we put in the houses. All right, so when we came to environmental data, this is an example plot. On the, in the green, you have the temperature, right? And in this particular case, we're using a feature called kurtosis, which is a statistical feature, if you're familiar with that, on, on the audio signal. And what we were able to show is as the temperature went up, 
right? We started to get some higher responses in terms of the, the vocalization. And this is just a quick example. It's actually an early slide. We've, we've refined it a little bit more. I'm not sure exactly what was going on here. Wayne and I were trying to remember what that specifically was. It could have been that, we, that that was when feeders came on or something else happened to drive some energy and some activity in the house. Um, but that's, that's an example of listening and hearing some information coming from the vocalizations of the birds. In addition, we did some trials looking at the age of the birds so we could tell within about three days how old that flock was just based on the vocalizations that they were making. And that was important as we start looking at doing a whole flock monitoring because you, you know that vocalization changes. As kids grow up, their voices change. As chickens grow up, theirs do as well. Um, so this was an interesting example of how we could very quickly then start understanding whether or not there was stress due to temperature in your broiler flock. We further went on and looked at some of the disease indications. And the top here on the, in the red plot are um, measurements done by humans in the, in, the, in the space. And this was looking at cough detection. And Wayne, I don't remember if this was uh, infectious bronchitis or laryngotracheitis. Do you remember which one this was? LT, okay, so this was LT. And really what we were doing is, so this is the human measurement. So they would sit in there and listen and count the number of coughs or the number of incidences that they measured. And then this is two different models, two different signal processing models. One's a support vector machine, the other's a decision tree type of process where we're capturing out features, we're then running it through a classifier and doing some um, analysis on that and then generating counts of what we saw. And what's really interesting is you can see the peaks line up very closely with this. And we first sent this over to the vets at the, at the um, so it was a bit of a blind trial. They just sent us all the, or we just captured all the audio data. We did not have this data a priori, okay? And then we sent this back over and said, hey, this is what we're seeing. And I think about 10 seconds later, the faculty at UGA picked up the phone and said, did you guys already see what the, you know, did you already see that top part? Because I haven't seen it yet. And I said, no. He said, well, I see, he says, I think it's lining up exactly with what we were seeing in terms of our clinical signs measurements. And the other thing is, so we had a couple of little blips early on. And we weren't sure, you know, we're, we're engineers. We're saying, well, it's there. We've got to report the data. And it turns out, I think this is when they were infecting the birds, if I'm not mistaken. And so we actually picked up some early, just quick, you know, discomfort when they were actually swabbing or infecting the birds as well. So this is an example of where we're doing this. What we found also is that at nighttime, you know, you can hear these sounds a little bit better. So the coughs, the rails, the snicks, because the birds are generally quiet or in darkness, right? The gen birds are generally quiet, and you can pick up a lot of different sounds. In addition to, you know, the, just the general cough, we've also been able to look at rails. Our, our graduate student, Brandon Carroll, did a good presentation at Poultry Science this year, um, talking about, you know, a frozen dictionary approach, and I'm not going to get into all the details on that, but really looking at how do you start defining the space of sounds that you might encounter, and then how do you build this dictionary out to try and accommodate the variations and the anomalies that you might hear in these sounds. Um, so it's very interesting. It's preliminary, right? I think we've done one trial in a full grow out house, and even that, the, it was a commercial house, and the grower wasn't all that keen on having microphones and cameras in the house, and so we only did one flock, and it wasn't necessarily, we didn't really see anything because they didn't have any sick birds, and that's always a challenge for us in terms of validation. Um, so we're excited to talk with others here in terms of driving some of that research forward, and if you have suggestions on how we might do that, we'd be open to that um, as well. This is just some of the hardware associated with the um, audio project. Um, these are isolator chambers that we were using up at the University of Georgia. So they had, I think, four to six chicks in each one as they were um, infecting them and then measuring the responses because they were doing vaccine trials on them, right? And so we're just piggybacking, throwing a microphone into, on top of the trials that they were using, or that they were doing. This system right here on the left bottom is a Raspberry Pi processor. And that thing has got an incredible amount of processing power. I mean, that, I mentioned the phone. That thing also has a very good amount of processing power. And it manages the, um, it, it pulls in all the data on the microphones. It pulls in temperature, humidity, and all sorts of other features or other measurements of environmental um, conditions. And it allows us to capture that data and then correlate it with all the other audio features that we're pulling out. And this is just a, one of the um, 
test beds, you know, that we had, just a just an example of one of the processors in a, in a, in a screen that we had in the house there. And then on the right-hand side, this is our, our vocalization processing test bed. This is one of Wayne's um, project visions, and that is how do we build a test bed that we can then put in data, collect information, and then automatically process. The challenge we have, and now I know a lot of you are saying, hey, listen, Doug, in the house we have fan noise, we have heater noise, we have people noise, we have trucks driving by, we have all these different sounds. So we've pursued a number of different avenues, um, and one is looking at anomaly detection, right? So what's outside of normal? Quickly identifying, is there a sound in that house that's outside of normal? And then how do we go about having a systematic process for processing those vocalizations or those external sounds? One example I give is in our commercial setting, all of a sudden we were hearing these clicks, click, 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 and it was going on for quite a while. And so we got on the phone because we're getting the data, you know, maybe an hour or two after it's actually gone through, and we kept hearing it for quite a while. We got on the phone and called the, the, um, the grower, and, sh and so they went out and checked, and she came back and said, oh yeah, our, uh, our feeder bin had stuck somehow, and there was no feed in the feeders, and it was just sitting there clicking along. So there we go as an example of early detection of something that's not necessarily um, health or environmental, but now it, but it is a well-being concern, right, of making sure that we've got water and feed to these, uh, to these birds. So when you start thinking about all the possibilities, it's pretty exciting about where you could go with some of this. The other thing that we're interested in, and it's really Wayne that's helping to drive a lot of the thinking along this line, and that is how do we build a more quantitative measure of well-being? And I know Colette talked this morning about Paco and some of the processes they have for auditing. We'd like to think about how do we build a more quantitative, but maybe a little bit less subjective. Because as we all know, I see the world differently, right? And what I think might be okay, you might not think be okay. And, it, and so, so as much as we can take some of that objectivity or subjectivity out of it and quantify that, I think we're, uh, we're better off in terms of making our case. So we'd be interested in discussions around that topic because quite frankly, we're not experts in animal well-being at all. Our expertise is in capturing the data, processing it, and trying to make sense of it. We really need support from you folks to help us make sense of it even further. All right. Grow out house robotics. This is another one I thought might be of interest to you. We have started looking at what's the impact of putting robots in a grow out house. And you say, well, why would we want to do that? Well, hold off. We'll get to that in just a second, okay? We, we think there's going to be lots of interesting questions associated with that. But before we could get to that point, we had to understand the impact of robotics in a grow out environment. So what's it going to do to our feed conversion? What's it going to do to our animal well-being? What's it going to do to our mortality, to all these other factors associated with, you know, the productivity or the production of that flock? So very early on, we, des we designed a trial, and this was in conjunction with um, Dr. Bruce Webster, Dr. Casey Ritz, and Dr. Gina Wilson at the University of Georgia. And we put a camera system up on top of the pen, and we decided to do three different controls. One was this ground robot that you see right here driving around inside the house. The second one was a flying quadcopter. Some call it a drone, but it's a, a little flying you know, helicopter thing going around in the house. And then the third was just a person walking in and walking around in that house. And what we did is we measured certain aspects of that, including what we call the halo effect, how far away from the, from the device or the person did those birds go, and then how quickly did they move away from it, right? And what was their general response? So we did both kind of a, a quantitative measure in terms of those, and then we also did a bit of a subjective leveraging the expertise at UGA to say, hey, did, are these birds under stress under these different conditions? And uh, the, short the, the short answer of it, and I'll show a video of it in just a second, was that really there was no difference between the person and which robot? Any guesses? The flying, the flying robot. And you know, they had about the same halo radius. So how do you think the ground robot did compared to the flying robot and the human? Better, Better. why? Ah, it's not above them, right. So, and, and this is me totally guessing, although I'll say Bruce had some very interesting thoughts in terms of predatory effects, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, but man, they, they, to the point where you see this bumper down here, we had to add a bumper to the robot because the birds just wouldn't get out of the way. Now, when they're young, you know, they're scattering and they're kind of curious, they'll run over to it, but they'll scatter. But the older they get, the more acclimated they get to it, Man, they're not interested in moving, right? So that also then becomes a challenge, and I'll talk about that in some of our autonomy planning. So this is the setup we had. We had a ground robot, 
For the second set of trials, we're starting to look at autonomy. How do we autonomously drive this robot in that house? The first trial, we just manually drove it, okay, flew it manually. The second one was, how do we build autonomy so that we don't run over birds? It's the biggest concern that we have. You know, we don't want to be creating more challenges in that house. Um, and so what's the scheme that we use for doing that? The other thing that's really interesting is we've got a Microsoft 3D Connect, or Connect 3D sensor on there. And now we can start thinking about a whole bunch of other things related to capture. So now we might be able to do some stuff like looking at gate analysis. We might be able to do stuff like doing your, you know, your mortality pickup. We can start looking at a whole bunch of other tasks for this particular robotic platform. And in particular, when you're starting to think, and I know we've kind of gotten a little bit I don't want to say um, lax, but we, we've, we've not had a major AI issue this year, thankfully. Um, but when you start thinking about that as a potentiality, it'd be nice to keep people out of the house if that's feasible, practical, and does serve the purposes of, of improving the animal well-being as well as the productivity of the flock. So when you start thinking not just three years down the road or five years down the road, but 15, 20 years down the road, could you conceive a housing system that has robots that do a lot of the work right now that you have people doing, right? Maybe even do some stuff to get them to move around, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe do some herding effects. So anyway, there's lots of potential applications then that you could start thinking about in terms of robotic solutions for, uh, for the grout environment. All right, autonomy, real quick. So this is, this is a very high level description of some of the programming that we did. I'll walk through it real quickly. Um, my colleague, Colin Usher, who was in the top picture up there before is, is the project director on this effort. But essentially you have a go. Go robot, you stick it in the environment, you say go. And then you either have a set of predefined targets or you have a set of targets it's gotta find. And those can be virtual targets. So anybody playing Pokemon Go? All right, my, my kids are on Pokemon Go, and I'm like, wow, I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know you could spend so much time Pokemon going or whatever they're doing. So anyway, but Pokemon Go, you go to all these virtual targets, right? There's not, there's not a monster out front in front of the building. And if you have kids, I mean, you, you might know what that is. But, but you can set this set of virtual targets up in the space, right? And have it go to these virtual targets based on some path planning for the autonomy. Or you can have physical targets, whether those are fiducials or markers on the wall or in a section. You say, okay, find that target and go to that target, right? So there's a number of different ways you could conceive doing that. But once you've given it the target and it's identified the target, then you give it the command drive to that target. All right? So you're driving to the target. If it reaches the target, you just increment to the next target, right? And you just continue that loop. That's the ideal condition. The, the, the less ideal condition is it's driving along, it's got that 3D connect, and it goes, there's a bird sitting right there. And you'll see that in a little bit, okay? And it stops and it waits, and then it moves forward and it nudges, and then it backs up, right? And then it nudges again, and then it backs up, until either the bird moves, right? Obstacle's cleared, okay? And then it goes back to driving to the target, or it fails, and it now turns a, a direction, a predefined direction, reroutes, finds the target again after it's driven around it. So there's this whole autonomy planning system, and to be honest with you, this is stuff that's really been done a lot in a lot of um, autonomous robotics, whether it's in the Department of Defense side or whether it's in um, industrial you know, warehousing type of work. So we're leveraging a lot of that in this particular application. All right, on to the fun part. So here you can see the robot in the house. We're looking at it from the top of the camera. The little red dots indicate different motion vectors and different patch, uh, uh, paths that the birds are taking. This is an onboard camera, so you can kind of get that perspective. Here's our flying robot, okay? So the flying robot is, is coming around. You can start seeing the a little bit longer trajectories. You can see the bird responses a little bit in there. Um, they're gonna move away from it a little bit quicker. Now, you know, you also have to understand this robot is a lot louder, all right? It's making and there's wind blowing down on them. So I just don't, yo, know, they don't like that too much, you know? And so they scatter pretty quickly. Um, but maybe not as much as you'd think. Now look at this one, right? Not nearly the same halo effect, right? Um, they're moving out of the way. They're getting out of the way, but they're not nearly as uh, far. So this is autonomous. This is moving autonomously. It sees those birds in there. We're looking at some, some breeder flocks here. And they're not really all that bothered by it. Matter of fact, watch that one sitting down. You know, we kind of have to bump him a little bit and get him to go. So this is just some examples of some of the tasks that we're looking at in terms of robotics in the grout house. And we think that we need to be starting to understand all these different aspects of it in order to have that long-term path of where we want to go with some of the robotics.
So I asked Yvonne if I could talk a little bit about some robotics and automation in the processing side of the facility. And she said, that'd be fine, you can do that. So I'm gonna show you two quick videos on processing. The first one is our intelligent cutting system. And if you've been in poultry and you've been in the US market, you see a lot of people typically on the deboning lines, right? And they're, they're manually deboning, doing what they call the initial shoulder cut, and then extracting and pulling the meat off, and then doing some tender cuts to pull the tender meat off. The, the there is automation in the space, all right, but it's what we would call fixed automation. In other words, there are equipment manufacturers that'll sell a automatic deboning system into the market space, but they're fixed automation. In other words, you have to sort, pre-sort your birds to a specific size and then run them through that machine. And if they're outside of that window, if there's a large variation in the size of that bird, it's just not going to do a good job of cutting and scraping the meat off that frame. So our premise was, let's go back and mimic somewhat the human performance on this. Let's measure every bird individually, take that external features, map that to the internal bone structure, and then build a cut trajectory path that navigates specifically for that bird, everyone individually. So let me run the video. This is how it's done currently, if you're not familiar in terms of a manual system. Um, and then I'll, it'll, the video will show kind of some of the processes that we go through when we start looking at it. So that's the cut we're interested in, cutting those tendons up in that shoulder. This is an old embodiment. Um, we've got a newer robot that's much smaller than that. And this is it doing the customized knife pass. So it's cutting in there, it's going right around the shoulder, coming right down along the scapula and doing the cut um, in order to, uh, to recapture that meat. So there it goes, and it's gonna come over here and do this side. And that's, that's, that's essentially the cut, and that's completely automatic, right? So it's just taking that based on imaging. So here it is on a moving cone line, um, and uh, in this particular case, we're only doing one side with this robot, um, and we're doing it slow for two reasons. One is, this is an old robot, which is why we've now got a new robot in the space, and it just wasn't able to do more than about 10 a minute. But it also is easier for us to see, right? Um, if I'm doing it at 40, it's gonna be moving by pretty quick, and you really won't be able to see some of the um, cutting. So why is all this important? Well, we feel that long-term labor is going to be a challenge, and I'll talk about that. Also, we feel that when you start looking at the automated systems that are out there, you're giving away a lot of yield, okay? Whether it's on, you know, just because of the natural variability of your product, you've got to start thinking of lot sizes of one when you're processing systems like this, okay? The other thing is, is this thing doesn't get tired. If you start looking at people, one of the biggest complaints is, is they kind of shortcut that shoulder cut initially. They don't, they don't do that really tight articulated cut right around the joint. And there's a reason for that, because if they were to do that consistently, we'd have a whole lot more challenges with some of our uh, risk of injury in the space. And so there's a number of reasons why we think this type of an approach is is a, is a more viable approach and something that, we, that we're excited to consider. And we're actually in discussion with a couple companies who are interested in, in looking at taking this forward. Now this one is a little bit of a different project. This one actually started off again, Wayne, Wayne kind of started this one, led it for us. And he came to me, and I have to understand, I'm an image processing guy, okay? And Wayne came to me and he says, I think we can see on the carcass when there's a bone missing. And I said, have you seen the carcasses? You mean you think you can see when there's a bone missing on that carcass after the meat's been removed? He goes, well, yeah, why not? I said, well, listen, I'm an image processing guy. I mean, I don't know if you can do it, but why don't you go see if you can do that? So we spent some time building, and, or Wayne did, and the team looking at doing you know, detecting missing bones. So broken clavicles, missing fan bones, all of the things that cause problems with bone chips in your meat. And sure enough, they could do it. They found a way to do it. They found a way to backlight the cone and make it give you an image that, that was really good. And so we took it to our industry partners and they said, hey, isn't this great? I said, yeah, that's good. That's pretty nice. I think that's, that could be helpful. Have to make us not have to use an x-ray system and get all the permitting and then you know it's slow and not always very accurate. That could be nice. And then one of them said, can you tell me how much meat's left on that frame? <laughs> and Wayne said, huh, if you've ever met Wayne, huh, maybe, right? And sure enough, so they went back, back to the drawing board and started looking at that. And I'm gonna play this video as it goes along. This was a test we did in a processing facility on a moving cone line. The initial embodiment would be on a standalone cone line, uh, just for simplicity's sake, to kind of replace the scrape test. So if you're familiar with the scrape test, this is where they do their quality measurement of how much yield they're losing 
right? So after the frames have been deboned, I mean, after the, the breast meat's been removed from the, from, the, from the frames, they take the frames, they scrape all the remaining weight off of it, and they measure it to see how much yield they're losing on each frame. So here's some example images. It looks a little bit like an x-ray image. It's not. It's actually backlit and using different wavelengths to capture the information from that. And based on that, doing the image processing, we were able to very accurately tell how much meat is being left on those frames. And so this is now a product that's been picked up by Gainco out of, out of Gainesville, Georgia, and they now have a commercial unit for this system out on the market and um, have gotten great reviews on it so far. So the idea is the user just has to put a single frame on there and hit a button. Remember I talked to you about how you might, you might see things a little differently than the next person than the next person, despite how much you've been trained. This takes a lot of that subjectivity out of it and allows them to get accurate results and you can do it much faster because you can just put cones on the whole, or, or frames on the cone, very quickly press a button and get that information. It gets relit up to a screen. Now you can look at pay for performance or incentives and other types of things to drive your productivity. Eventually we'd like to see this integrated into the cone line, right? <laughs> where every frame would get measured in this way. So another example of where we may start it off over here, found that the, that, the, that the industry opportunity was really here, and then drove to kind of drive a, drive a, a space in that. Now, think about this in conjunction with the robot, right? Now, if you have a problem with your deboning robot, you could detect it, right? Because all of a sudden you're getting higher yields. So now you're starting to think about an integrated approach to this whole system. You're not looking at just individual problems as we go along. You're now starting to think about the entire process as a system. One of the things that we always want to do when we're looking at a project is we want to have a feedback loop. In other words, I don't want to just do a quality measurement to throw product away if I can at all help it. We want to have a control loop that we could do something about it, okay? So anyway, this is just an exciting project, one that's a little bit outside the box. So what's poultry going to look like in 2050? Well, it may not be that far off. I used to have to say, well, it probably won't look like that because people would get all nervous, but it may not be too different, you know? Um, but robotics and automation are going to be a key to us man managing and maintaining our productivity levels simply because our workforce demands are, are changing and the people in the workforce are changing in terms of their expectations. So it's important for us to think about that. How are we going to do that? Innovation, right? So well, what really is innovation? And this is, I'm going to give it just a little bit of an of a innovation talk, maybe a bit of a pep rally, hopefully. But what is innovation? Innovation is the creation and use of a better or more effective, and you, you fill in the blank. It can be a chemistry, it can be a automation, it can be a material, it can be a process, it can be a fabric, I mean, any type of thing, right? There's two key components, the creation, and what's the second one? All right, everybody, we gotta wake up. The second one, creation and use. Innovation, let me tell you, my daughter is very innovative. She's 11, all right? And she takes piano lessons, and, um, and uh, she came to me, Daddy, I got this great idea, because she's now playing music where you have to turn the page. I've invented a turn page turner, okay? I said, you have done what? I've invented a page turner. I said, well, let me see it. And so I go out there, and she's got this straw with duct tape and a paper clip and all sorts of stuff, and she's manipulating it with her mouth, and she's trying to play the piano. I said, that's fantastic. It's very creative. You know, is it an innovation? Probably not, right? How useful, how easy is it to use? I mean, so use is a big component of the innovation cycle. Don't tell her I told you that story. She'll be a bit embarrassed, I'm certain. So let's talk about it. Clayton Christensen um, broke it down into kind of two different categories of innovation in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. This is an old book. It's from 1997. Sustaining innovation and transformative, he called it disruptive, transformational innovation. Sustaining innovation evolves and existing with better value. Here's some examples. Honey Nut Cheerios. Who wants just plain Cheerios other than my wife? Um, who wants just plain Cheerios, right? Give kids a chance. Plain Cheerios or Honey Nut Cheerios? Oh, Honey Nut Cheerios, right? What about all the different flavors of Tide? Those are sustaining innovations upon a base platform. How many of you have an iPhone 6? Show of hands, quick, quick, quick. iPhone 6. How many have an iPhone 5? All right, yeah, so a few. Was there really that much difference between the iPhone 5 and the iPhone 6? No. I mean, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying it's a sustaining innovation, right? 
Now, when the iPhone first came out, that might have been disruptive because nobody's carrying around flip, phone, flip phones anymore, right? So that was disruptive initially, but then you have the sustaining innovation. It's important. And then there's disruptive or transformational innovation. This creates an entirely new, eventually disrupting or displacing the existing, all right? Let's use some examples. Ah, I can't show, can't be at a talk without showing the Georgia Tech Ramblin' Wreck, right? <laughs> Anybody come in on horse and buggy today? No, right? The automobile was a disruptive, a trans, a disruptive innovation. It's a little bit old. What about flat screen TV? How many of you still have a cathode ray television tube in your house? Okay, one, two, I got bad news for you. I've got really bad news for you. It's the old big tube televisions, right? Goodwill will not take them. <laughs> all right, you're done. I don't know what you're going to do with them. Sell them as a boat anchor or what, but they won't even take them, okay? So how many of you have a flat screen television in your house, right? Who doesn't have a television at all? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, all right? I'm sh the reason none of us do is we're not young enough. There are lots of kids who do not have a flat screen television in their house. What do they do? They watch it on the computer completely. Okay, so flat screen TV, Netflix. How many of you have been to a Blockbuster lately? <laughs> not going to happen. How many of you have a Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, some other kind of streaming account? All right, I'm telling you, you're showing your age here, folks. If I were to do that at, in a class here for one of your classes, you want, they would, they would all know what that is. And ha if they don't have one themselves, they're, they're pirating off of their friend or their, their parents. But just to change the paradigm, right? It changed the paradigm. Now, what's interesting is Netflix made a shift, okay? Originally, what were they doing? Mailing your discs, right? And if you had three, you couldn't get another and all this kind of jazz, right? And then they made a shift. They saw it coming, they anticipated it, and they made a shift to the streaming services. Um, digital camera. I mean, who does not have a digital camera, right? It's all on our phones, right? It's all, well, they're not phones anymore. They're, they're digital cameras that you can talk on, I think, or who knows what they are. But the digital camera is one of my favorite examples. This was invented by a guy by the name of Steve Sassoon. He worked for a company that over the course of about 20 years, you know, um, filed for about 1,000 thousand plus patents in digital imaging. The initial system was about the size of a toaster oven, right? That was the initial, initial digital camera. And it was grayscale, right? But you couldn't really tell who the people were. You could see it was a person in the picture, but you just couldn't tell whether that was Candace or Yvonne or, you know, you just couldn't see who it was. I mean, it was just so bad, right? And over the course of time, they refined it, they refined it, they refined it. Unfortunately, this company in the late, in the late I think 2012, filed for bankruptcy. Before that, the five years before that, they let off 40,000 employees, shut down over 10 manufacturing facilities, and, um, simply couldn't make the jump. By 2013, 14, they'd sold off their entire intellectual portfolio of digital imaging technology. Who's the company? Kodak. Kodak. They missed their Kodak moment, it seems like, right? So what happened? Why? Why did that happen? What was the reason for that? I mean, they invented it. They had the corner on the market. They were the first ones. They, they had Steve. Steve was their guru. He got it. He actually was pretty decent by the end. What happened? What was the price of film? What was the profit margin on film? 75%, right? And it wasn't just film. What else did Kodak produce? Paper. Paper. What else? Color. Chemicals. Yeah. Toner, color. And not only that, Every single piece of equipment that sat in a CVS, a Rite Aid, a Walmart was made by Kodak, right? Fuji came in late, but when you could go and get that one hour development, remember that? I got another kid's story. They saw a thing of film, they said, Dad, that's a really small camera. I said, kids, that's not a camera, that's a film. And I just kept going and she stood there going, a what? Film? What is that? You know? But, but I'm just telling you, that's, see how quickly it's changed? See how quickly things change? And they just simply couldn't get off the, their main business core, unlike Netflix, they couldn't get off their main business core and transition to the new paradigm. So it's very important that we do that. All right, let's talk a little bit about technology innovation cycles and trends. This is typical of a development cycle, and it's just, it's just general, right? So over time, you have sustaining innovation that slowly gets things better and better. So this is our automation efficiency, better and better and better over time, right? And then you have a transformational innovation event. The problem is, oftentimes when that innovation comes in, at a point in time, it's much lower down on the automation efficiency than the current state of the art. It is, the camera, digital camera was much worse than going to a Polaroid and clicking, here you got it right away, right? Um, 
But what we don't recognize is the new trajectory of development is going to eventually overtake the existing, and at some point in time, you're going to surpass it right here. And if you're trying to jump on the bandwagon of innovation right then, you're too late, because somebody is already riding that curve, has momentum investment, and can do this much better than you can do, and that's what happened with Kodak. All right? So it's important that you look at these curves. Let's talk about production and poultry, right? This is a remarkable story. If you look at feed efficiency, I mean, this is incredible. Growing time in weeks, percent mortality. We talk about animal well-being. This is a remarkable story over time, right? Fabulous. We've got a great tradition here of adopting innovation in the poultry business, all right? What's the concern you see on this? Oh, I'm sorry? Plateauing. It's plateauing. It's flat. What does that mean if we look at our previous slide, those curves flattening out? It's ripe for some transformational innovation to come in and totally change some things, right? So the game is changing, and I, didn't, I did not go into cahoots with Candace ahead of time, but we picked, I happened to be lucky. Let me just say that. I picked several of the things that I think showed up as being priorities. Um, so how do we plan for a resilient future for poultry processing and production in the future? We think you've got to fundamentally rethink the whole process. We've got to be willing to step outside our comfort zone and explore. We do, and quite frankly, the universities are a great place to do that, right? We can fail, I, I mean, we're allowed to, all right? We try not to, but we have that option, and it's a great place to partner and, and do some exploration outside the box. Um, pursue an integrated systems approach. Remember I talked about the, the cone screening and the robotics as an entire systems level approach? We wanna do that all the way across the spectrum. Think about doing genetic selection potentially for processing features, not just production benefits, right? How about that? What about that aspect of it? And then identify and solve some grand challenges. And this is really a, a community initiative. So what are some of the grand challenges? And this is um, where I got lucky, all right? And I just picked these because I've just been around a bit. But food safety, I think, was one of the number one, right? Environmental impact, all right, was on there. Animal well-being is another one. And then labor and automation. They're worried about the conditions of the workers and the, that are raising those, plant, those animals. These are the new things we've got to work towards and we've got to look at addressing in terms of our grand challenges. So how do we do that? Through partnerships, right? One of the things that I've taken on is kind of a mission. You understand, we don't have a College of Ag, did I mention that? We don't have a College of Agriculture or Poultry Science Department or Animal Science Department, so we've gotta have the partnerships. And so I've taken it on to try and take these opportunities to network and get to know people who we can partner with in a meaningful way to drive some of this. Develop thought leaders, this is very important, okay? Develop thought leaders not just within our communities, but in other communities that are willing to be advocates for us. Adopt advanced technologies. We can't run away from them because that paradigm is, is if we don't invest in some of those early transformational innovations, somebody else will and it probably will be international. I'm just warning you, all right? Um, and then drive transformational innovation. And this is creating a culture within your space that says it's acceptable to look at new paradigms um, across the different, uh, uh, you know, the different sectors. And really, one great way to do that is to look at the intersections of disciplines. And this is just a graphic. So this is where I like the job that I'm in. I'm in the engineering space. But I love partnering right there in that overlap with the agricultural sciences, right? Whether it's poultry science or animal science or dairy science. And then there's this technology overlay. And the technologists don't even know. Do you think the people with the iPhone knew that they were gonna be helping us collect data in a grow out house? No, right? But it's a platform and we know how to leverage it and we can use it. And it's really in those spaces where we have opportunities for, for, uh, for doing some things. So you say, okay, Doug, you've talked a whole lot about this, but what are you guys really doing that's transformational? All right, now don't, don't, don't lose me here, all right? This is really outside the box. Yvonne, I'm gonna show the, tra the trailer, all right? And I could be booed out of here by the end of this. But I asked my team, I said, let's really rethink how we do live haul transportation. What's the only time our customers really see our birds? On the truck. Is that the best presentation of our product? No. So what can we do differently? How can we think about that differently? How can we redo all of that to make it so that we're doing a better job? The other thing is, is traditionally, we grab them in the house and we stick them into the cages and then they get dumped at the, at the, at the processing plant and then we grab them again and we hang them in shackles all alive, right? Boy, we're touching them multiple times, we're grabbing them. I mean, it's just not as ideal. So what I did is I asked my team to think about how you might do it differently. And so we said, well, what if we did certain aspects of processing on the farm and we only touched the bird one time? 
right when we catch it, okay? So what would that look like in a conceived drawing or a conceived system, right? So students got excited about this and they said, you know, what would it look like if we did this completely differently? What if we had a shackle system in the trucks, right? So we actually did a stun in, in a slaughter right at the farm somehow. And then we hung them in the trucks. I know USDA won't allow it, I'm, I hear you. But just wait, stay with me, stay with me, all right? We've got to think differently, folks, or we won't get anywhere, right? We've got to explore this. As a matter of fact, I talked to some colleagues up at USDA, and Jeff Buer came, and he said, you know what, I'd love to look at some of the bacterial loading. You know, what happens when we, when, we, when we have bacteria on those birds? And so he did a study on that, and he said, well, what about feather pickability if you're dead so long? Turns out, if you let them sit there for, I think, four hours plus, you don't need a scalder. What? We didn't know that. Those, they couldn't even hold on to the feathers to get them out. They couldn't put the tension on it. The, bird, the feathers were just falling out of the bird. So there's all sorts of things we've discovered just in this simple couple of trials, okay? And now think about it. They're running down the, tri the, the, the road in an enclosed trailer. We're starting to capture blood and other things in a pan that we don't have live load shifting anymore. They're on a shackle. Now you've gotten rid of your live hang, right? Because you can do a shackle to shackle transfer at the plant. There's all sorts of things now that you can start thinking about differently, okay? And so the other question was, well, how many birds can you get on a trial? You can't, you can't get all those birds on there. Well, you can't. I mean, we, I don't know how many birds are being put on trucks right now, but we were looking at between three and 4,000 birds, depending on the weight of the bird, given current you know, load limits. So it's not too far off, right? It's a difference. Now, will it end up looking like this? Maybe not. It may look very different, okay? But we've got to start thinking about some things differently, and that's what we're excited to do, and we're willing to take some risk, okay? We're willing to kind of explore some of these ideas. We'd love to have partners that do it with us. And with that, that's my team. It's not my team, that's the team, all right? These are the guys that really do all the work and support this program, and we're very excited to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to present. So thank you, Yvonne, appreciate it. a couple of minutes for some questions if anybody has any. It's kind of, yes. Yeah, so we've, we've actually had some conversations with a couple of different companies. They're interested in that. I mean, there's a company that's got a, um, that's got a system that's on a mobile platform already. And actually, I think they were doing some trials at one point in time with USDA. I think they're planning to do it again. And so we're actually already in discussions with them. And Yvonne actually was kind enough to make some introductions. When I showed this to her, she didn't run away, thankfully. Um, but uh, so, so yes, we're actually looking at some alternatives there, right? This is a bit of an older you know, diagram, but I think there's some options there. One of the things that we want to do is make sure we could have continuous feed. So you'd have to figure out how to manage that so you didn't have a batch process to keep it moving because you got to get those birds out. Great point. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Yvonne.